Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today, as usual, we are so excited and honored to talk about decrypting the steganographia with international author and scholar, Dr. Stephen Skinner. Now, listeners, I know you might be asking yourself, why is the steganographia the most notorious work of the German Benedictine abbot and polymath Johannes Tritemius. It was written in the year 1500. Is the Steganographia a text about the evocation of spirits? Is it a system of cryptography where information is secretly encoded or both? Well, internationally acclaimed author, practicing magician and scholar, Dr. Stephen Skinner is the perfect person to ask as he returns on the podcast. Dr. Skinner has again collaborated with Daniel Clark in an upcoming publication where all four books of the Steganographia are being published in English for the first time with extensive explanations and commentary. It's, it sounds like it is just going to be so vital and, and so excellent as usual. This upcoming edition of the Steganographia contains the remaining parts of books one and three with detailed spirit registers covering 32 spirits, but it also features a full translation of book two, which contains another 25 spirits and book four, which relates the steganographia to Paracelsus, the Almadel, and the Shemham Farash of Solomon, Adam, and Moses. So this looks to be absolutely an, an excellent collection and, and a scholarly and important restoration of the grimoire tradition of the magical tradition, broadly speaking. And with all that being said, Dr. Stephen Skinner, Thank you so, so much for taking the time and stopping back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. It's always my pleasure, and I, I do enjoy talking to you. And uh, you, you just summed it up perfectly. I don't really need to say anything more, do I? <laughs> well, uh, I, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> but, but, I, but I will, because you can't shut me up anyway. So, uh, <laughs> nor would I ever want to. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say no comment, please. Um, so... I could just um, mention, first of all, what does steganographia mean? And it comes, uh, as uh, Alex has said, it is sometimes seen as a cryptography uh, manual and sometimes seen as a, a magic manual. So I have to admit up front, I know a bit about cryptography, but I'm not a cryptographic expert. And, but I do know a little bit about magic. So the focus of this book is primarily in the magical direction rather than the cryptographic direction, but I'll explain more later. So what does the word steganographia mean? Well, it's made up of two Greek words, and the usual translation is that it's secret writing, uh, stego for secret and graphia for writing. But if you look at the Greek properly, uh, stegano actually means watertight and graphia is writing. So it's actually a book of watertight writing. Um, and we, we, may, we may come to that a little bit later. At least people now have heard of it and they stop saying, is it a, a book of shorthand or uh, stenography? Uh, in fact, I've had arguments with people about the spelling of it. Oh, it should be stenographia, shouldn't it? No, it's steganographia. Okay, so... Um, who wrote it? Well, the abbot Trasemius. Now, this is an amazing thing that an abbot well known in Germany actually wrote books on magic. And uh, the, the Inquisition didn't turn up on his doorstep um, or drag him off in chains uh, because he had powerful friends like Maximilian, uh, the Emperor Maximilian, etc. But you had to do a little bit more than just have powerful friends to avoid um, the Inquisition and, and their pals. So uh, the question is, was it a book on stenography with a bit of magic thrown in or a book on magic with a bit of stenography thrown in? And you have to ask yourself, if you were an abbot in, in the year 1500 in Germany, uh, which of those two things would be the most inflammatory? And the answer is you're more likely to be done for magic than to be done for um, writing secret messages. 
So um, my conclusion for a lot from a long time is that it's a book on magic with cryptography thrown in, uh, so that um, Trithenius had deniability. If he was ever grabbed by the Inquisition, he could say, no, it's a book on secret writing. Can't you see that? Are you stupid or something? Uh, and uh, it's not. It's a book on magic. Uh, and in it, there are, uh, what was it, 57 spirits with full details, 25 plus 31, I think. So that's uh, 56 spirits. Um, and it's practical. Now, how did, uh, how did Trithemius get into trouble with it? Well, he sent uh, a copy of it to his friend um, who was uh, in uh, Ghent and who was a Carmelite monk. And he knew this guy was, was okay talking about magic. But when, um, when he sent it, uh, because the mail was not perhaps as fast as it is today, um, his friend in uh, uh, the Carmelite monk had actually died. So when it arrived, the head of the monastery there opened it, looked at the book, and was completely shocked. Because what is a, one of the, the church senior members, an abbot was a fairly senior title, we're doing writing a book on magic, and that unfortunately for Trasimus is where his um, reputation as a magician uh, began, and he spent the rest of his life uh, fairly cleverly fending it off and explaining what it what it really was, you know. Anyway, so Trasimus was an abbot, a historian, a magician, and, and a monk. And how did that happen? Well, he was. I'm sure everybody's heard this story, but I'm just going to tell it because I like this story. He was uh, coming back from having visited his family in uh, Trittenheim, and he was stopped by a snowstorm. So he he pulled in, as it were, if he'd been driving, it would have been, uh, to the local uh, monastery, which was um, uh, which put him up for the night. The next morning, he set out again. Weather looked okay. He didn't go very far, and then a huge snowstorm came again. And so he was forced to go back and and plead, uh, do you mind if I stay the night again here? And uh, I think he probably privately thought that it was the hand of God telling him this is where he was supposed to be. So instead of moving on on the third morning, he uh, decided to join the monastery as an ordinary monk. Um, he was in his late teens. But being an incredibly intelligent man who read and spoke um, a number of languages, you know, definitely Latin, definitely German, uh, probably a dash of Hebrew, etc., uh, and some Greek, um, the, the monks realized uh, what a powerhouse intellect he was. And when he was 22, maybe 23, they elected him as the abbot of the monastery, and from then on it was up and up until the point where he sent his um, unfortunately uh, deceased friend a copy of the Steganographia. One minor thing that people uh, probably never mention is that his original name was Heidenberg, um, which literally translates from German as from the pagan mountain, which I think is a lovely way of looking at his name. But um, he took Trasenius to celebrate the fact that he was born in Trittenheim. So it was the man from Trittenheim uh, became, his, uh, became his name. He was also the teacher of Agrippa and to a lesser extent of Paracelsus. But Agrippa utilized his huge library of magical books to um, learn up about magic and then finally to write about it. And I think nobody's going to argue if I said that Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy is probably the the main text of Western uh, magic. And um, so you could see uh, Trasemius as being, uh, if not the fountainhead, at least a fountainhead of, of uh, European magic. And, and the actual fountainhead was his library, but I'll, I'll talk about his library a little bit later. 
So Dr. Skinner, given all of that historical background with Trithemius, um, can you share about what differences did you find between the printed Latin text and the manuscript that you worked from? Right. So uh, when I started this project, I was looking around and I saw that Adam McLean had actually made a, a decent um, English translation, but he only translated volume one and volume three, leaving volume two and volume four untranslated. Um, if anybody wonders whether there really was a volume four, then you just look at um, Culliano's book, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, uh, where he confirms that there were actually four books originally. Anyway, so um, I was lucky. Well, in fact, it was Daniel uh, Clark, my co-author, who was lucky because he uncovered a manuscript of the Steganographia, which was not as old as the German manuscripts, but much more detailed. So it was obviously translated um, at the point before um, uh, before people started losing or destroying uh, manuscripts. And so as you can see on this picture, the illustrations were a bit sketchy. This one just shows um, a few of the directions. And people mostly thought, oh, well, it was just an example of some directions. But no, in the original manuscript by Trithemius, which we don't have to hand, he showed all the directions. Um, so in the manuscript I worked on with Daniel, you can see uh, much, much more detail. So realizing that the, this manuscript that Daniel dug up uh, had two more volumes and a lot more detail and illustrations which were um, much more complete, I thought we got to translate it. Um, so. Uh, and that was a that was a mistake. I mean, if I'd realized how much work had to go into this, I would not have made that decision. But anyway, I did make the decision, and uh, we went for it. Oh, that that is so lovely, Dr. Skinner. And I think it actually follows um, a really interesting point that you made uh, sharing many years ago that when you first came across text. So for instance, I remember a story and I'm, I forgive me, I'm going to butcher this, some of the facts, but you were very young and you were, you went to the local bookstore and you were trying to, I believe it was the Lamegatons Goetia or Crowley's. Um, it, it, it was. Yes. Yes. And I love that when you, when you went in and, and said, I, I would like to, I have an order for this. And, and the person up front said, Oh no, no, he's much too young. And then finally, I think it was the manager that came front forward and said, Oh, Stephen, he's, he's fine. It's okay. You know? And I thought, what a, what a powerful story about, especially at the time, you know, discovering a text for the first time. So to that point, Dr. Skinner, can you share with us, uh, when did you first come across this specific text, the steganographia? Okay. Uh, just to add a little bit to the anecdote you told there, the, the bookshop manager, it was the Adiar bookshop in Sydney, and the manager mm. was Cecile Novi, who has very sadly passed away very recently. Mm. But she was a lovely lady, and um, she was aware of the fact that it was fairly safe to leave the Goetia in my hands, and thank God she did, because an awful lot of uh, work came out of that. Anyway, when did I first come across it? Well, I'd been interested in Dr. John Dee from way back, um, uh, and, and we're talking 13, 14, uh, we're talking pretty precocious. Um, and in it, um, D, uh, or reading about D, I heard that uh, uh, D had once copied by hand the whole of the steganographia, sitting somewhere in, I guess, Germany, working from a, a Latin manuscript. And I thought, well, if D thought it was that valuable, that it was worth the considerable effort of copying by hand. And, and here you can actually see um, a copy of, of that copy. You can see that D had done a lot of work, and his, um, his illustration there is much more complete than the, the printed one. So I figured that the printed copies, um, even in, in, in German, um, were not as complete as some of the manuscript copies. So that was my first desire. Wow, 
<laughs> if D thought it was good, it's got to be good. And then uh, Adam McLean, who is a, a guy who's very famous for his knowledge of alchemy, uh, arranged a partial translation of Volume 1 and 3 in 1982. Uh, and by comparing it with the Latin, I realized that um, books 2 and 4 were missing. So that, that gave me more reason still um, to uh, produce a complete copy. I decided to translate all four books into English, again, a foolish decision, uh, when I was convinced that there actually were four books and, and not just the three that people had mentioned. Ah. So, um, there you go. Well, I, I believe, and I, I try not to speak for the listeners, Dr. Skinner, but your foolishness and the foolishness of Daniel Clark and everyone else has certainly been to the to the boon of of pushing the boundaries of understanding of the grimoire tradition. So I must say it, it, it certainly is a wonderful thing. Um, and speaking of Daniel Clark, actually, Dr. Skinner, can you tell us this is a uh, several times now you have collaborated with Daniel Clark. How did, how did this process work? You know, you have two great minds tackling this text. Can you tell us about that relationship? Well, I have to admit, I've never met Daniel. It's all been online communication, but the communication has been very good um, because Daniel has got an amazing brain. Um, he's located down in Tasmania and I was uh, originally located in um, Malaysia and then Singapore and now London. Um, but Daniel has his hand on where all of these manuscripts come from. Um, more than anybody else I know, he has um, an insight into which collections uh, have got which manuscripts and uh, how to get copies of it and has a huge digital collection. And he was very generous from day one in um, lending them to me if I wanted to work on them. Uh, and finally, I decided, well, let us work together. Uh, he's a delightfully clear-headed guy, and he doesn't take any kind of bullshit. He just uh, does what he needs to do. So um, uh, we worked on it together, and Daniel's many skills included dealing with these libraries who, who uh, hold their own manuscripts, but also research and um, repairing, uh, digitally repairing the manuscripts so that you go from something which looks appalling to something which is actually very clear. And uh, if you, you can see here one that of uh, the same picture that Daniel has restored and uh, so we've used his restorations in the book, and uh, it's so much better than trying to look at the original. We don't redraw them, no. We just take the original and clean it. As well, Dr. Skinner, you know, something you touched on at the beginning of our chat is uh, that, as Joseph H. Peterson says, quote, the steganographia is Trithemis's most notorious work. In private circulation, the steganographia brought such a reaction of fear that he, Trithemius, decided it should never be published, end quote. So, Dr. Skinner, can you share with the listeners who might be hearing about this for the first time, why was this work so notorious, if you will? Well, I suppose the first um, the first push at it being notorious was the, the uh, Carmelite uh, head of the monastery opening somebody else's mail and then reading it with horror. Because he didn't just then put it on one side, but he sent copies around and told other people about it. Uh, not very, not very reasonable of him. But so that started off, and people then sort of took up. Oh, uh, this abbot is doing um, magic. He's invoking spirits because here are all the details in this book. Blah blah blah. And Trithemius then had a bit of a job um, tamping this down. But the bottom line is that in dealing with spirits in this way was not natural magic. And in those days, um, scholars, monks, etc., used the word natural magic as defense. Uh, so the church could go, hey, what are you doing? And they say, no, no, we're just doing natural magic, you know, herbs and stones and the 15 different varieties of correspondences, which um, everybody knew about in those days, but they don't know. Um, 
and nothing about uh, dealing with spirits, you know, in, in standing in a circle and stuff like that. But of course, that is not the sort of magic that's in the steganographia. It is spirit-based, evocatory magic. Um, there you go. And uh, Trasemius destroyed or suppressed the more extreme parts um, to save his reputation. But fortunately, some of the translations, including the one we work from, uh, escaped without being too heavily cut. There is always a possibility that uh, we haven't got the most complete manuscript in existence, but I can be very sure that it's, um, um, I can't think of a percentage, but it's twice as complete as any of the other manuscripts wandering around, or even the printed version, because the printed version was uh, from an early Latin version. One of the first times, Dr. Skinner, that I heard about this uh, debate with the steganographia, is it cryptography? Is it sorcery? Was actually, and I'll reach in my bookshelf here, one of my favorite tomes, the Goetia of Dr. Rudd, the third volume in the Source Works of Ceremonial Magic series, where you and David Rankin explore this issue. And you touched on it just a few moments ago, Dr. Skinner. So I'll just ask, um, you mentioned that the steganographia is a book about magic, not cryptography, but what is the relationship between encoding messages and then the sending of those messages to spirits? Can you just give us kind of the full picture? Okay. So this is quite a subtle point. So it takes a bit of explaining. So first of all, what is the relationship between evoking a spirit and using cryptography? And there is a relationship um, so that some uh, grimoires suggest that the uh, evocation should be encrypted or the name of the spirit should be encrypted, etc. And that always sounded a bit weird to me. But then if you think about what uh, Austin Osman Spare was doing, he was taking the um, magical result that he desired, written in English, and then he was um, uh, using cryptography or his own version of cryptography to produce something which doesn't mean anything, a series of letters and things. So he was also using cryptography before um, uh, calling for the spirit. And one of the things there is, of course, you ask the question, what languages do spirits speak? And in the Middle Ages, they, they would have been assumed to speak Latin and possibly Greek, um, which was good because everybody in those days spoke Latin, uh, not the case anymore. Um, and therefore, uh, what you needed was to focus on the outcome that you're looking for or the name of the spirit. And one of the uh, practices is you could encrypt it. Because when you encrypt something, you have to think about it a lot. Uh, and so this, as it were, underlined the desired result, and it got through to the spirit. Whereas if you just stand in the middle of the room and quickly read off something you wrote 10 minutes ago, this doesn't have the same impact. So it's increasing the impact by encrypting now. Sending messages uh, via spirits is a, a different thing, but you can still use uh, cryptography to stress it. Uh, so let's stand back from there. What uh, Trasemius was aiming at was the 1500s version of um, email. He wanted to be able to send messages to monks who knew about magic in other monasteries on the other side of Germany or in Czechoslovakia or in Italy or whatever. He didn't very sadly have email, but he figured, and it is true, that he could use spirits to take the message. So you give the message to a spirit. You First of all, you've got to call the spirit properly. Give the message to the spirit and tell the spirit to deliver it to uh, Mr. Bovelis in, um, I don't know, Prague or something. And the spirit will do that, but the problem with the method is when he gets there, 
the recipient will not either understand the message or understand that uh, something has been sent to him. So it had to be with um, somebody who also understood the magic, who knew what the invocation was to material, not materialize, but to consolidate the spirit and to get the message. So it's quite a complicated procedure, just like with email, you need uh, machinery at one end to encrypt a message into um, into electrical pulses, and then you need machinery at the other end to unencrypt it, as it were, into a piece of, of sensible English. Dr. Skinner, where have you practiced this? Have you engaged with the steganographia? Yes, I have experimented, and I have to say that Unless the recipient is well-trained, well-versed in the method, it's quite difficult. Uh, and so I found that sometimes I can simply send the message so that the person dreams about it rather than the spirit actually explaining it. But then I thought, well, I'm not going to waste much more time on this because email is much, much more efficient and much, much more accurate. But... Um, yeah, there's a 500-year gap uh, between one method and the other. So although the objective of a lot, a lot of the steganographia is to send spirit-carried messages, there's other stuff in there that's of use to people who are interested in magic. Dr. Skinner, as well, something that ties into what you just shared is people have been wondering for centuries if the steganographia is a book about encoding messages or summoning spirits you just added a bunch of excellent context there and to that point we have a few uh, listener questions for you from glitch bottle patron anna madalena and anna is asking uh, her first question is i'm very eager to know what details you have culled from the steganographia dr skinner well, one of the uh, details that I found most interesting is that the Steganographia has, across two of its books, uh, two complete spirit registers. Now, a, a spirit register um, will be familiar to anybody who's read the Goetia. It's a list of spirits uh, with details about what their offices are, in other words, what it is they're capable of doing, and uh, sometimes their sigil. So um, that was the first thing. But in the Steganographia, every spirit has its own private invocation, which is very rare, probably completely unique, because the usual procedure is you have a standard evocation into which you insert the spirit's name. Uh, but this is somewhat more powerful because you are using a, an evocation in a language which I'm, I'm not going to specify, um, but one not very commonly known, uh, to call that spirit. And that spirit uh, should get the message a lot easier. Uh, talking about that, somebody once asked me, what, what, um, what senses do spirits have? Well, I can tell you that they can hear, even at, um, well, is it a remarkable distance, or are they, in fact, very close, but in another dimension? But they can certainly hear. And the spirit will recognize its own name, uh, even if you mispronounce it a little bit. The other thing they can do is they can smell, because the choice of incenses is critical for magic. Um, you have uh, different incenses for different planetary spirits, for example. Um, and spirits actually are attracted by beautiful smelling atmosphere. Um, so when you say that the spirit is invoked, you can make things convenient for him by um, burning or vaporizing a smell that he likes. So I can say that spirits have a, a sense of hearing, a sense of smell. I can also say that their uh, sight is not that clear, because I've done certain experiments, and I'll just leave it at that, that they're not very clear with sight. Maybe it's the difference of working across two different uh, worlds. But given those two things, uh, the sense of smell is the hint why, um, why magicians have to 
bath or clear themselves bef immediately before an operation because they do not like the smell of human beings. Um, and so, in fact, some magicians recommended that you actually slather yourself with um, some sweet-smelling uh, incense or whatever, and that works quite well. Dr. Skinner, as well, uh, this just popped into my head, so let me just let me just ask you between Anna's questions. But in another one of your tomes, I feel like I'm pulling every book off of my bookshelf here, and the um, the nine Ruddian provocations, the um, Solomonic archangels and demon princes. One of the pieces of advice that is given is to never. It's one of the beneficial aphorisms says never mix experiments. So you either focus on more celestial operations or more sublunar, if you will, slash chthonic operations for these spirits. Would you classify the spirits in the steganographia as angelic or in the theurgia Goetia? They seem to be these aerial spirits, these dukes that can yeah. wander. Can you share a little bit about yeah. yeah, they're actually um, sublunar spirits or aerial spirits, mm. uh, so they can float around in the atmosphere. Um, if you get them to materialize, then they will be just floating around rather than standing on the floor or anything like that. Sublunar is a nice word, anything under the moon, but it excludes sonic or yeah. um, subterranean spirits, which are a, a completely different sort of animal. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. I, I, I know myself and I, I'm sure the listeners really appreciate that. Um, back to Anna's question, uh, Anna's next question. Uh, we broke these up a little bit. Anna's asking and, and commenting, Dr. Skinner, that it always struck me as strange that important state secrets would be encoded by lists of spirit names. Can you comment on, on this a little bit? Yeah, the, the messages are not encoded by the spirit names. The spirit names are actually labels for particular encoding messages. So if it was, um, let's say, Parmesil, uh, this is a particular um, encoding procedure. So then they're labels. And you could have used animal names. It could have been the giraffe encoding and the rhinoceros encoding. But uh, Trasemius has used spirit names, which has confused a lot of people because they they trying to see some connection between the encoding and the magic, which I've vaguely explained already. To Anna's next question, Anna's asking, in particular, Dr. Skinner, I'm wondering if you agree that the occult aspect of, aspect of the text is merely a blind for the deeper cryptographic work, or if it has a double valency as both a code book and an esoteric tome. Well, it does have a, a, a double valency, and, and Trisemius must have been a fantastically bright guy because he's managed to work both things into the text. But the uh, cryptography gives him deniability. Uh, if he's brought up before a, a body of his peers or the Inquisition, he can say, no, you stupid people, you can see it's about cryptography. And I've just used the magic to frighten people away from it. Uh, because he knows he can't be done for cryptography, it's not a crime. Uh, however, invoke, evoking spirits uh, might very well be a theological crime. So mm -hmm. when he's got that um, deniability, it's achieved itself. And, but his cryptography is also there, and um, it's not the most efficient cryptography, so you might need a um, 100 words to just make a very short message. Uh, and there are much better ways of making um, short messages cryptographically rather than wasting so many words. But uh, what what do I know about cryptography? <laughs> quite a lot, quite a lot. Uh, and and so it seems, Dr. Skinner, that, you know, Anna's saying exactly what, what you just commented on, which is in some places in Europe, possessing such a book of necromantic names, those demonic names could get you in as much trouble or more trouble as passing along state secrets, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, state secrets, uh, well, for example, D was, was uh, an intelligence uh, for Elizabeth I, but I'm sure a lot of the stuff that he was sending back to, to England wouldn't have got him into trouble. But... Um, 
having been convicted of uh, evoking evil spirits um, from the church's point of view, that would have definitely got him into trouble. So the necromantic names are, are much more dangerous than passing on secret information. One of your primary areas of focus, Dr. Skinner, and it's even in the name of one of your books, are, is the techniques, the technological application. And you mentioned, along with David Rankin in The Goetia of Dr. Rudd, a wonderful tome that, quote, the same tables used to encrypt also produced the spirit names, end quote. So roughly, Dr. Skinner, can you share with listeners who might be hearing about this for the first time, how does this whole process work? Is is the practitioner supposed to derive the spirit names first and then encrypt a message for the spirit? How, do, how does all that work? No, it's, it's two separate processes. So you can generate spirit names by using tables of Hebrew letters, um, um, using a sigil to tell you which cell in the table you go to from which cell and on to which cell uh, you spell out a name um, quite, or even the reverse process. Uh, you spell the name onto the table and that gives you the spirit sigil because the ingredients that you need for an evocation are the name of the spirit, the sigil of the spirit, um, and then you need to calculate what is the best time to call them uh, as etc cetera, etc cetera. that's using tables to produce the the name of spirits or or to check the sigil or to reverse that um but it's not it's not the whole process uh, encrypting the 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 message for the spirit is a separate process so you you know the spirit name you call the spirit you tell the spirit your message in whatever form whatever language whatever cryptographic form and then he will convey that more or less accurately, and I, I can't swear always accurately, to uh, the distant friend or um, who is similarly um, aware of this magical technique, and then he will say the necessary words. And more often than not, uh, the message will come to him in dream. The um, Trisemia says the spirit will whisper it in his ear, but um, my experience is that doesn't always happen. It's more likely to turn up in the dream mm. on the, the following night. Reminds me, Dr. Skinner, of something you touched on before. Uh, there's a, I believe in the PGM, there's a spell that says that you can have a message and the deity will appear in someone else's dream as the God that they believe in, as opposed to what you believe in. So um, well, let's... See, that's a very sneaky piece of magic. Yeah. If you, um, I, I do know the method for inserting thoughts into other people's dreams um, in such a way that they will believe it's their own thought. Because, you know, you wake up in the morning and not all the thoughts in your head do you immediately recognize. Um, but uh, a much more effective way is to have uh, in that person's dream a figure who is their god appear to them and mm -hmm. tell them you must do this you must do that and then they can go oh my god told you you know if it's a, a catholic uh, it it may be a saint uh, if it's a pagan then it may be a pagan god but to incorporate that god into the delivery of the message makes it very highly effective as well, Dr. Skinner, um, I think this this next part touches on something that you brought up at the beginning of our chat, and also something David Rankin talks about when he in his uh, Grimoire Encyclopedia when he talks about the building of magical momentum or magical tension. And you say, "quote that the mental effort involved in encoding the message to the spirit." is part of the magical procedure, end quote. Can you share why Why is this so important, Dr. Skinner? Well, most people take a very casual attitude to magic. Oh, I'll just quickly rattle through the invocation and then I'll tell the spirit what I want. No, you have to use a lot of, um, I wouldn't say brain power, but a, a lot of intention. Um, People will say that magic is mostly psychological. I, I definitely don't believe that. But I know that when it's, when you do it, it must be done um, 
with intention and carefully and precisely, um, which is why three of my books start with the word techniques of. Uh, technique uh, comes from a Greek word, which means um, uh, a craft or a procedure. And I like to think of magic as something that um, is done scientifically, but only scientifically in the sense of uh, method. So you, you try something out, uh, you record your results, you formulate theories and that, and then you test the theories. Well, it's not quite as complicated as that in magic, because a lot of the instructions are already available in the grimoires. And so you use them, but you use them carefully and with attention, uh, just as if you were driving or flying a a rapid plane, you need uh, attention and intention. Otherwise, you might come to a nasty, nasty, sticky end. Yes. Yeah, so you would consider, Dr. Skinner, this mental uh, technique, this this preparation of encoding the message as just as important as, say, gathering your materia magica, your wand, your sword, consecrating things. It, it sounds like it's it's that important to the technique. Yeah. Yeah. And producing your array of tools. And people say to me, well, why do you need tools for magic? Why can't you just sit in your armchair and, and think about it? And that does not work. Um, or at least it doesn't work for me. Uh, there may be people who can do that, but uh, not anybody I immediately know. And you see the same thing in uh, Chinese magic uh, or even martial arts. I mean, there's a, there's a well-known story of um, a village which was being attacked by some raiders, and the one of the, the one of the tea masters there tried to contract a uh, samurai to teach them how to fight with swords uh, and fight these people off who were destined to arrive in the next week or something. And of course, the master said, "You've got to be kidding! I can't teach you what you need to know in a week." Tell me what you do know. And he said, well, I, I know how to do the tea ceremony. And I do that with a lot of attention. And I do that um, regularly. And I am really a master of that. So the uh, samurai simply taught him how to clean a sword and replace it in its scabbard. And told him to apply the same degree of intention to that as he did to the tea ceremony. So when the raiders turned up, uh, there was the, the, the tea master pretending to be head of the village, and laid out in front of him was uh, one or two pieces of equipment, and he cleaned them and presented them in the way that he would have done for the tea ceremony. And the raiders looked and they saw, this guy treats his tools like this, he obviously knows what he's doing. We'll go and find an easier village to raid, and they left. Ah. So um, the point of that slightly oblique story is that the 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 weapons, and they are called weapons of, of magical practice, need to be treated with a great deal of respect and intention, and they need to be exercised and consecrated, um, and these actions then give them. Uh, much more than psychological power, but it, it does give them a, a power that then can work. And the spirits can appreciate that. They look at a magician who lays out his tools uh, properly, cleans them, wraps them in the right colored silk and so forth, and they figure, this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, we, we better not mess with him. People find it hard to understand when I explain it, but... I think the uh, the Chinese tea master is a good parallel. Absolutely, one of the ways I've I've phrased it is uh, based on everything that you've shared and Frater Ash and Shasan and other guests is um, instead of operating on the laws of physics, many grimoiric interactions and evocatory procedures operate on the laws of meaning and intention and being able to meet them in a specific laid down pre. Uh, mutually agreed upon terms and a specific ritualistic structure that gets results. I don't know yeah. if that's a fair way to think about it, but yeah, yeah. And, and going back to a previous conversation uh, we had a few minutes ago, 
um, in the uh, Greek magical papyri um, and in the old Egyptian temples, anybody who had just eaten garlic or fish was not allowed to come in and was certainly discouraged from doing any ritual or, or worship or ritual inside the temple because the spirits do have a great sense of smell. Uh, so the spirits can cotton on to what we're doing, uh, that we're doing the right technique and uh, that we are masters of what, what we are doing. And that, that instills a certain amount of fear and obedience. Dr. Skinner, in addition to those vital elements, one of the things that you mentioned that's necessary for the successful completion of an evocatory procedure in the grimoire tradition is the seal, the sigil of the spirit. And to that very point, the very few number of seals found in the Steganographia match exactly to the seals found in the second book of the Lamegaton, namely the Theurgia Goetia. So, can you share, Dr. Skinner, why doesn't the steganographia contain more of these uh, seals? Right. So, as we've already explained, you, to, to call the spirit, you need its seal. So, that it's not sufficient to have the steganographia. You've got the evocations, you've got the spirit's names, you've got the times, etc. But uh, when Trithemius is writing that, he also composed the Theurgia Goetia, uh, don't be distracted by the name, uh, which I think is a later edition. Um, and in that, he had the same spirits, but he had their seals. And he knew, being a sensible lad, that you should keep these two elements separate. However, if you're a practicing magician, then you need to bring these two elements together and you use the seals in the Siege Goetia, which have got the same spirit names as the invocations, etc., in the steganographia. So I suppose this is a little pug for, uh, yes, if you're going to do this, you also need to buy um, Dr. Rudd's Goetia because in there will be the seals that you need. Ah, I see that Alex is waving it around. Thank you very much. And that's not a coincidence. It's part of my progress through the, the grimoires to cover, hopefully, all the bases uh, by the end of my time. Uh, I think historically, uh, the Siege and Goetia was made at the same time by Trithemius and kept separate. And its path as a manuscript has been different from the Steganographia. Uh, but you can now, because they're both in English and they're both published by me, you can bring them together and make it work. A truly very, very valuable resource for uh, people who want to read about it, for people who want to practice this. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it, Dr. Skinner. And uh, just as a brief follow-up question, do you think the author of the Theurgia Goetia used tables to derive the numerous seals, just as a follow-up to that? No, you don't okay. use tables to derive the seals. Um this is a technical area I don't want to get into, uh, but they were derived at the same time, I think, and then put in a separate manuscript. Of course, Trithemius, being the abbot, had all these monks in his uh, scriptorium who would write stuff for him. So um, this is something I would have loved to have myself. Instead of having to type it, uh, I'm mm -hmm. a one-finger typist, and I just type with one finger, and it's not nearly as fast as being able to hand uh, some rough copy to a monk and say, go off and um, inscribe that on parchment or whatever, uh, such, such luxury. But on the other hand, I don't have the Inquisition looking over my shoulder or uh, what was left of the English laws against, um, against magic, which were, I think they abolished in 1951, which is a bit late, but at least they've gone. So it's a trade-off, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy. Yes, those are powerful, motivating forces. And, and as a fellow one-finger typer, I, I certainly sympathize, Dr. Skinner, fully, fully, absolutely. Um, well, my, 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 my mother yeah. said, uh, you don't, I said, I need to learn to type. 
because I'm going to produce a few more than a few words. And she said, no, you don't. You'll always have a secretary. Your father had a secretary. You'll have a secretary. You don't need to learn it. And then she was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right. In, in addition to being the scholar and, and translating things and pouring over manuscripts and the welcome library, and the in addition to all of that, you also are then typing through everything, of course. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I've, I've, I've tried. Um, I've tried one little program where you speak and it types it up for you on the screen, but it's it always gets the technical words wrong. And so you've got to go back and retype. And in the end, I've timed myself. It's almost just as fast to type it yourself. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it would it would be very hard to tell Microsoft Word or something to, you know, Bain Chooch or Adonai Shaddai al Hai. You know, it might it might not get all the all of the letters uh, correct. Yeah. There. So you got to you got to go back and rework it. So you might as well type it in the first place. <laughs> right. Anyway, Absolutely. <laughs> that's just my problem, not anybody else's. Earlier, um, I, I asked you if you practiced the steganographia and you you shared your answer but just as a follow-up since you publicly shared about experimenting with the lamegatins goetia as you've shared and also the ars notoria have you experimented with the theurgia goetia or or is there anything else you'd like to touch on about experimenting with either the steganographia or the theurgia goetia um yes i have because to actually uh, do it right with the steganographia I need to re-import the sigils. And I thought when I produced this edition, maybe I should sneak the sigils back in. But that's not its not academically acceptable to do that. So you still got to put two books next to each other and, and, and work on it from there. Uh, I'm still working my way through the, what was it, 56, 57 uh, spirits. Um, and there's some I'm just never going to get around to, but I've worked my way through handfuls of the more interesting ones you were talking about the samurai story earlier one of your uh magical colleagues and one of our magical friends uh frater ashen chasan uh, excellent grimoireic traditionalist and practitioner um he has a question for you dr skinner saying dr skinner can you please share about how the angels or if the angels inspired the techniques or the technology for the ciphers themselves what are your thoughts on the angelic involvement in imparting the knowledge for coded information found in the steganographia i i don't think the angels uh, taught trithemius um, cryptography for a start a lot of trithemius's cryptography is, is very very stolid um, having to translate a large, as I said before, say a hundred, hundred words into a, a five word message or something. It's just not practical. Um, so I don't think they did. I think that uh, you've got to give Josemius' brain the credit for the cryptography. Thank you for that additional context, Dr. Skinner. And uh, speaking of other guests who have been on the podcast, we have a listener question for you from Mihai Vartejaru, who is asking and saying, Dr. Skinner, are the 31 spirits listed in the Steganographia actual spirits that may be contacted, or are the spirit names just an ideal spirit catalog devised by Trithemius as an example of his cryptographical method? Well, I've sort of answered that already. Um I can see that Mihai is uh, working from old English translations or even from the, the Latin uh, because he only mentions, uh, what was it, 31 spirits, whereas in fact with the when you add in the second volume, uh, you add another 25 in. Um, no, the, the spirit names are real. They do conjure. They will come, um, and they will do work for you. Uh, if you approach it in the right way. They're not just empty counters for his uh, cryptography. Now, I admit that my bias is biting in here, that I'm not interested in cryptography because uh, there are now programs uh, like um, some of the uh, cyber currency uh, things with passwords, which are, I don't know, 56 letters long or something, which do cryptography well above anything that um, Truthemius uh, could have done. But his magic still works. 
um, but his cryptography is, is still a bit slow, and so I don't think the angels provided it to him. If they had, it might have been a little bit more efficient. Yes, that's that's one of the things among many that I'm so thankful for is your insistence, Dr. Skinner, on practicality. I, I remember in a previous interview, you said that, and I'm inserting the word tortured here, but you even tortured yourself learning Demotic Greek, not for, you know, liturgical or, or the appreciation of history for practical use. So you you go to very far lengths to have a practical effect on the results of magic. Yes, yes. Learning, learning uh, I mean, Greek, is, it was just so much pain <laughs> but 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 worth doing absolutely and uh you know you've you've touched on a few figures here dr skinner historical figures and and researchers practitioners we have a follow-up question for you from mihai vartajaru who is asking is dr skinner aware of the 20th century romanian historian ioan petru culiano who attempted to decipher trithemius's cryptographic code uh, yes, I'm very aware of Culliano. He's, he's one of the academics who have actually done practical magic, uh, which which means that his other academic colleagues are a little bit, well, were a little bit wary of him because he's not around anymore. And he left Romania and went across the States uh, where he finally worked at the University of Chicago. But um, terrible things happened to him. Uh, he was actually assassinated uh, in the toilet block of the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. Now, why he was assassinated, um, I think, in my opinion, is because he kept uh, abusing the um, post Ceausescu communist regime and saying bad things about them. Uh, he was certainly uh, disliked by Ceausescu. Uh, I have another story about Ceausescu, which I probably shouldn't tell. But um, getting back to uh, Mihai's question, yes, um, Culliano's book, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, is, is full of useful stuff. It's not greatly arranged. You don't go easily from one topic to another. But there are lots of gems scattered throughout that book. Shall I tell my Ceausescu story? I, I've, been, I've been wanting to ask you, yes, because you've teased it out so well. So please, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, I worked for a publishing company, uh, which was owned by Robert Maxwell. And Robert Maxwell knew Ceausescu because he was uh, involved with a lot of Eastern European uh, regimes. Um, he also knew Brezhnev, he used to go drinking with him, uh, which must have been quite the effort because Brezhnev could really hold his booze. Um, anyway, uh, in conversation, Ceausescu asked Maxwell once, well, you know, how, I've got a bit of a bad um, image, certainly a very bad image because he was doing lots of bad things. How do I clean my image up? And uh, they came up with the idea, ah, well, we should write a sort of vaguely sterilized um, uh, biography saying all the great things you did of course then it was up to Ceausescu to think of some of the great things that he'd done apart from um, demolishing about a quarter of uh, of his capital city to, to build one of the largest palaces ever seen and he must have used an enormous amount of the country's wealth to do that um, but uh, that, that's, that's another issue anyway um, I'll not get too personal about this, but Maxwell hired a, um, with a bit of advice, somebody to uh, write this book. And Ceausescu provided tons and tons of, of information. Most of it uh, had to be adjusted to make it sound good. And uh, the book was written, and uh, because I was involved, uh, the book was printed. And um, I can't remember how many copies. It wasn't a lot of copies because Maxwell didn't think it'd sell very well, but he needed to send uh, 20 or 40 copies to Ceausescu to show that he'd kept his side of the deal. Let me think, that must have been uh, round about Christmas 1989. 
because uh, I was working in publishing back in those days. And just as it was about to be launched, Ceausescu was um, uh, tried very quickly in one, one evening, taken out of the back and shot, um, along with his wife, uh, so that the, uh, the opposition forces then took over Romania. And we were left with a, with a warehouse full of this um, made-up story about Ceausescu. So I got an urgent message from Maxwell, destroy it, destroy it. And I did. I kept two copies, which uh, must rank amongst the, the rarest copies in the world, and the rest uh, went off for, I can't remember whether it was burning or shredding, but it was definitely completely destroyed. Just as a quick aside, you've had so many... Um uh, involvements and fingerprints with other publications. For instance, I'm thinking of the wonderful Black Easter novel with with Blish and the, yeah. co the conversations that you've had. I'm thinking of that humorous yet very teachable story at university about Alice Bailey and this person dropping off a truckload of books of, of Alice Bailey, too. So it, it seems like you're right that in this case, I mean, this was a very, you know, intense personal involvement and literally being told to destroy those books. I mean, wow. Yeah. Well, somebody actually had to do the, the dirty work of destroying them, but the, the command came down from Maxwell, who uh, I, um, because I was uh, on his uh, magazine publishing side, I saw fairly frequently. Uh, but that, that's, that's stories for another day. Given all this, Dr. Skinner, did Culiano deal with Trithemius's system and offered the first version of an invocation of a spirit prince in his book about magic in the Renaissance? Well, I have to correct that and say it wasn't the first um, version of an invocation of a spirit prince because a lot of grimoires have been concerned with that uh, over, the, over the period. Because uh, spirits are quite hierarchical, or at least the way we understand them is hierarchical. So they have princes and dukes, etc., which is mainly a, perhaps a reflection of the way society was structured in the Middle Ages, or it could be actually some real structuring. Culiano's story was not the first, but it was probably the first time a professional academic had, uh, had explained that. Uh, Culiano used to make an offer to his senior um, PhD students that they could learn magic with him, uh, but only on condition that they did each of the experiments as was taught by him. And so he had a limited number of takers on that, but he did actually teach uh, practical magic to some of his students. Uh, all I can say is lucky them. When I was at university, I didn't get any uh, any offer like that and had to fight my own way through the sources to find out how it works. You know, when it comes to technique and the important elements of magic, you've been tracing this out for years. You've been connecting the various techniques over, you know, thousands of years. And you and David Rankin, in your excellent collaborations, you mentioned that for a system like the Theurgia Goetia, that of course is heavily dependent on the uh, steganographia, that three elements are needed. The encoding of the message, facing the correct direction, and the proper time of the day or the night. So broadly speaking, do you feel, Dr. Skinner, that all three of these elements are vital to all grimoiric operations and all grimoiric work? Yeah, basically, yes, but, but particularly time and direction, because uh, it's one thing that the spirits understand and we understand. Uh, and regards to timing, um, although some of the uh, times listed in the Goetia, uh, which relate to the, um, to the titles of the spirits, uh, don't actually work that well, uh, but timing that relates to uh, the planetary hours and planetary days, that works very well. Um, and people ask me, well, why should calling a spirit at um, 8 a.m. on a Wednesday, a mercurial spirit, work better than calling it when it's convenient for me at um, 6 p.m. on Thursday? And uh, my answer to that is, well, 
if you want to talk to your doctor and you turn up this surgery at 3 a.m. Uh, on Sunday night, do you think you're going to get any, uh, any help at all? And the answer is that spirits do have, um, what do you call it, uh, not a schedule, not a thing, but there are times when it's good to try and talk to them, and there's times when it's not good. Um, you wouldn't invoke a spirit of Venus on uh, in a Saturnian hour on a Saturday, because it just you you know you're stacking it against yourself. If your invocation is very powerful, maybe, but why make life difficult? Uh, and so timing is very important. The other thing about direction, um, well, as you can see from one of the illustrations that I showed earlier. Um, the spirits have specific directions. And if you wanted to talk to somebody and you walked into their room and you turned your back to them whilst trying to convince them to do something, they're going to think that's very rude and they're just not going to be helpful. Now, spirits may not think you're very rude. They may think you're a little bit stupid because you don't know the correct direction. But I think that, uh, well, I know that invocations and evocations, which are done facing the correct direction, work much, much better. So that's time and direction. This bears on the steganographia because the first book, uh, the first two books have got the, the spirit lists in them. Uh, one of the books deals only with direction, which is the first book, and the second book deals only with time, which are the um, planetary hours, etc. Um, so there you are, it's very clear that two different sets of directions. Uh, I find in practice, if you get them both right, then that, that's even better. Um, the uh, uh, question of cryptographic uh, things is not so important. Cryptographic is a bit important in steganography, but there's a lot of magic where um, crypto cryptography or uh, messing up the, the words uh, in the way that A.O. Spare did, is not so important, but time and direction are essential. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. I, I, I know myself and I know the listeners always appreciate those just vital reminders, no matter what grimoire direction you are looking at exploring. That's, that's excellent. Um, we also have a listener question for you, Dr. Skinner, a few from Andrew Nichols. And Andrew is saying, uh, in the first part of the question, we broke these up a little bit. I'm not as familiar with Dr. Skinner's work as I hope to be one day. So forgive me if this has already been covered in his work, but as someone living in Australia, I'm frequently confronted by the Northern hemisphere centric nature of the majority of the esoteric and goetic canon as a fellow Antipodean who has spent at least some of his career based South of the equator. I wonder if Dr. Skinner has any thoughts about how to navigate this. Okay, well, this is a very interesting question for me because uh, it is applicable to magic, but it's also applicable to my other great interest, which is classical Chinese feng shui. And, and I don't mean um, simply moving your furniture around or painting a wall red or whatever else. Uh, I mean the really classical stuff, which I have been interested in for a long time. And that question in, is asked, well, if all these feng shui rules work for the Northern Hemisphere, what do we have to do in the Southern Hemisphere? Should we flip them on their head? Because climatically, the warm bits are in the North, um, as distinct from in Europe, the warm bits are in the South. And the quick answer is no, you shouldn't. Uh, because although climatically, uh, the two hemispheres are quite different, um, in fact, in terms of direction, they're the same, because east is the same direction in the northern hemisphere as it is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, west is also the same direction. Even north and south are the same direction. It doesn't all scramble as you go across the equator. And then further to that, um, as I lived in Singapore for 14 years, uh, Singapore is very close to the equator. You could almost say it's on the equator. And 
um, I did not notice walking from one side of the island to the other any difference, um, nor did I notice anything uh, in Indonesia south of the equator as distinct from uh, Singapore. And so the short answer is no, you don't have to flip things either for feng shui or for magic. So although for feng shui it's much clearer because uh, direction is a very big and uh, thing in feng shui, it's also very important in magic. And uh, no, you don't have to make, uh, you don't have to bend it around. Oh, the the other thing, um, I had uh, a friend who said that um, if we're doing horoscopes, um, the seasons are, are different. So um, uh, you should uh, flip the horoscopes as well. So I said, okay, give me give me a detailed analysis of myself. And he produced something which was diametrically opposite to everything that I'm made up of. Ah. Uh, mm. And and that 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 killed it for me. That uh, no, you don't need to mess around like that. It's just perfectly good to use the same rules on both in both hemispheres. Mm. And this follows Dr. Skinner uh, with Materia Magica, I would assume as well, because Andrew is asking and saying, for example, does Dr. Skinner feel it would be more efficacious to cheat, quote unquote, by buying a hazel wand online or to experiment with substituting an Australian tree so that I can cut the branch myself? Okay. The, the essential thing is that it should be hazel, not that you should cut it yourself. Hmm. Um, if you've got the hazel and you have and you bought it through Amazon and somebody else has cut it on the other side of the world, it doesn't matter. You still have an, a hazel wand. And the spirits will know that it's, if you turned up with a eucalyptus wand, uh, waving it around, this is not hazel wand, and then they'll just not then just ignore it. Um, so you don't need to do uh, a special uh, change. Uh, and, and besides which, if you decided to just select a different tree, you might have to go through a hundred different varieties of tree before you got one that was even halfway as good as hazel. So stick with the plan. Don't uh, don't unnecessarily mess it around. Um, as uh, Frada Ash and Chasen once said. Um, you sometimes have to make changes on some of the um, some of the uh, magical procedures, but they're usually quite small, and they're usually not to make life more convenient for you, so that you can have any old stick rather than a hazel wand. Yes. <laughs> It's about putting in putting in the work and and putting in the effort and and I I very much appreciate Andrew's question and you sharing your expertise, Doctor Skinner, because th those questions I think do come up when people wonder, especially in this global shipping world and everything else. So that is that is lovely. And uh, Andrew also has a final question as well, Doctor Skinner, saying, "Okay, um, while well, moving from hazel wands to say." with seasonal timings or the dates of pagan festivals that align with the seasons, which I know is moving away somewhat from Dr. Skinner's area of expertise, but he's mentioning as an example, can these Dr. Skinner be transferred south of the equator wholesale or should they also be flipped? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll start with saying not flipped. But um, if it's a cultural uh, thing, then maybe you do have to adhere to its um, site of origin. So, for example, I can tell you from practical experience that uh, dealing with uh, spirits like fairies um, works quite efficiently in Wales or Scotland uh, in Celtic areas. But trying to invoke those same entities in Singapore does not work, or it doesn't work for me anyway. So um, there is uh, an element of, of that, but you don't just flip it. You don't then say, oh, well, we'll, we'll invoke a, a, a demon of um, some other source uh, simply because we're in the Southern Hemisphere. No. Um, so you have to, yeah, for, for spirits, they are sometimes located in particular areas and they will not happily go from there. 
most most demons, however, are available throughout the world. Uh, if they're called right, they will come, because they're not culturally embedded in one particular area or another. So following through on cultural embedding, um, if you're trying to call an Australian Aboriginal spirit, uh, you will not have much of a chance outside of Australia, uh, or indeed outside of um, some of the more barren areas of Australia, uh, which is the, the same thing as uh, don't try calling um, fairies in Singapore. Yes, and and some of the spirits, uh, as as you so excellently delineated, Dr. Skinner, for instance, in the Steganographia, these are sublunar spirits. These are not Chthonic spirits. But it sounds like it would be fair to say that spirits found in the Steganographia, the Lamegatons Goetia, the Aerial Kings, and the Heptameron, these are not spirits that are bound by a, a specific section of the globe. These can be called pretty much no matter where you are, if you follow the appropriate method. Would that be somewhat fair? Yep. Yeah, that's that's definitely fair. Um, I picked two extreme examples, which are very culturally connected, the Australian Aborigines and the fairies. But for most other spirits, they are uh, available throughout the world. Excellent. Well, Dr. Skinner, returning to this theme of techniques, for example, um, I've seen this online, and I'd, I'd just love to run this by you. You you see this kind of general misconception online that, and again, this is a uh, false dichotomy and, a, and almost a caricature, but some people might say, well, Solomonic magicians, they're purists who want to reduce the grimoires to only cookie cutter mathematical steps that are mechanical and repeatable and it's sterile. And when I'm online and I say I do the grimoire this way, I have a grimoire purist, you know, saying, no, you need to do it this way. But to me, talking with you, Frater Ash and Chassan, I mean, so many practitioners, um, I get the opposite, you know, that that this is very, very much based on the methods, the scientific method, but it's also based on developing re your own individual relationships with spirits. So, so can you kind of share about this conception or misconception that people might have, Dr. Skinner, about it only being a strictly mechanical process? So there's, there's several elements there. Um, it is not, it is mechanical in the sense that you have to do the right things to make it work. If you, you burn tar and um, uh, st stand on a beach without a circle or something, uh, it's not going to work. You have to do the right actions with the right tools in the right place. Um, so that's, that's certainly, uh, but that's not cookie cutter, is it? So um, don't confuse that with my own scientific approach to it. But with any, with any uh, technique, uh, if you're a brain surgeon, you need to attack the right part of the brain, um, not with a spoon and fork, but with the right equipment. And you need to do it at the right time when the person is under um, anesthesia. Otherwise, you'll cause terrible problems. So yes, you need to absorb the, observe the rules. But that doesn't make it cook, cookie cutter. It's not magic. Is not simple. Uh, you have to work at it quite hard. Uh, Ash and Chasen um, initially did a number of operations where people would have just given up, but he persisted, and then he figured out what was the small change that needed to be done to make it work right. Um, then the other thing is a lot of people say that you need to create a special bond with the spirits. That is certainly true if you are trying to uh, create or encourage a familiar. But if you're just um, using, and I say using because I mean using, one spirit for one particular action, and you may not call them again for a long time, uh, such bonds are not necessary, but the, the correct procedure is still necessary. So would it be fair to say, Dr. Skinner, just to button up this uh, topic, if, if someone's out there listening, they love your books, they're reading about the Solomonic Method, and if they're wondering, well, gosh, 
why is Dr. Skinner so focused on repeatability and the steps? I think it would be fair to say that you can easily teach the steps, but it's not so easy with personal relationships because those are so idiosyncratic. They're, they're based on your yep. unique interaction. Would that be fair? That's absolutely true. Let, let me draw one more parallel, which sure. I have uh, previously done. Um, uh, working with spirits, invoking them, and training them, if you like, to, to answer and, and do the things you want is just like working with a, trying to domesticate a horse. If you get a wild horse, there are several ways you can do it, you know, but you will certainly need to um, put a halter on them. Um, you, you will certainly need to have them in an enclosed space. And in this case, the horse needs to be kept inside the railings of the, of the park, uh, unlike spirits, which need to be kept outside the railings of the magical circle. Um, and then you can't just shout at them in English or Latin or Hebrew. You need to actually um, use tools like sugar lumps, um, or if you're a harsh person, uh, a whip. But you need to have these tools to domesticate a horse, and you need to observe the same rules. And there's a fast way to domesticate a horse and a very slow way. And if you make up your own way, it probably will take forever and it won't succeed. But if you use the standard procedure, you will domesticate the horse and then you will later ride it safely. Um, and you need to harness it unless you're very clever at bareback riding. So it's like any task, you need to do it the, the right way. You don't need to cookie cut it. But you need to um, do a method which has been proved to work in the past. So that that's that's all. David Rankin in the uh, Grimoire and Grimoire Encyclopedia mentions that in his decades of experience with, for instance, the Lamegatons Croatia, he and I'm I'm probably paraphrasing or butchering this, but he effectively said he didn't find he needed to use uh, in the go goetic context more of the you know putting the sigil and the fire and burning, you know, specific foul smelling things, but that over time using the Barolinensis conjuration, you know, using certain aspects of the vinculum that he could get those results. So does that kind of go to what you're saying about, Hey, there are various techniques, there are various paths, but the goal should always be to engage with the spirit so that it is successfully called and bound. Yes. And, and the procedure is that you should use, First of all, um, as close as possible to the, the standard grimoire procedure. Uh, it's only later when you can do it and you can call the spirit and direct it two or three times. Then you can ask it, you know, how would it be easier for me to call you if the spirit says, well, if you have a radish present on the altar, then it will work much better. That That's a bad example. But... You know, you will get information from the spirit, and then you can use it. And as as, as uh, David has been working at this for a very long time, uh, he has modified stuff. But these people who start and decide immediately they want to modify it, oh, I'll use a kitchen um, kitchen spoon rather than a, a, a wand, and I'll do this and I'll do this. This is not going to work. And you're just um, you're just hobbling your your progress. Um, I should add that uh, since my first evocations, I have now been doing magic for sixty years, and uh, not that I'm sixty; I'm somewhat older than sixty. Um, and during that time, I have had to work really hard to get the methods to work for me. But once they're working for me. Uh, then I can make slight changes and things, and then it's repeatable. And it, because it's a technology, it is repeatable. You don't want to have to climb the mountain every single time. And you can come back and even shorten the technique, but you've got to do it right first and have it succeed, and then after that you can think about what you might like to change. I... Uh, I can't hack it with pupils who want to change everything to start with. I want to, I want to do it in the weekend, and uh, I want to do it without the right tools, and I'll, I'll use my brain, and none of that works. 
Right. Exactly. Just substituting Thor for every reference to Adonai and the Heptameron would not be a good first step in the ritual. I think that's safe to say. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Skinner. Uh, so, Listeners, um, we just have a few more questions for Dr. Skinner and a very brief after show uh, about some interesting points about consecration. But before we get there, um, listeners, I just want to remind you, please check the podcast and video descriptions to click on the link to pre-order your copy of Dr. Stephen Skinner and Daniel Clark's Steganographia. Uh, the links will be below. But Dr. Skinner, um, just as we get ready to wrap up the main part of the podcast, you're always working on something. I remember you said that you have a list in front of you of, of many different projects. And as you go through, you, you pick and cross some of them off. So can you give us any hints about what other projects you are working on right now? Yeah, this, this is my latest project. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> you, only, you only get a quick look at that and you can see my penciling um, on the, the Latin uh, and it's another book by Trithemius, and um, it's uh, it's to do with the the origin of many of the grimoires, uh, and so it is faintly complementary to to um, David Rankin's fantastic grimoire encyclopedia, for which there's no replacement at all. This is this is merely a, a supplement to that, um, which I hope people will like, and that. That project is 85% um, finished, um, but it will take a while before it finishes up on bookshelves. Excellent, Dr. Skidder. I, I know myself and I'm, I'm, I know the thousands of listeners are very, we're, we'll keep our ear to the ground on that as always. Um, can you tell us, Dr. Skinner, of course, listeners can click the links below and, and pre-order their copy of the book. Um, and how else can they support you? How can they check out uh, your your other works? Obviously, I'm thinking of Golden Horde Press, but anything else you'd like to share with listeners how they can best support you? Uh, well, I'm always interested in people uh, telling me, ah, you know what you should do next? You should translate, or you should do this, or you should do that. Um, or several people have said, uh, you should uh, catalog your own experiments. Well, that, that's, that's a hell of a big task spread over a large number of years. Um, so suggestions like that are always welcome. I may not immediately answer you because I get something close to 200 emails a, uh, a week. And uh, so sorting through it takes a fair slice of time. But if you do come up with a, uh, a good idea for stuff which has not been done but should have been done, then I would truly love to hear, hear from you. That was excellent. So listeners, uh, make sure to reach out to Dr. Skinner if you have any suggestions on upcoming projects. Dr. Skinner is always dealing with a menagerie of different projects. But if there's any other suggestions, please feel free to um, send those to Dr. Skinner as well. Um, Dr. Skinner, I know we have a very brief after show, but is there anything else about the Steganographia, Trithemius, anything else at all, Solomonic uh, evocatory aspects that, that you'd like to leave listeners with? Oh, well, there's always lots of stuff to talk about. But um, uh, with regard to Trithemius, as, as a person, uh, he has lost a lot of um, fame that he was due. It's like John D, and for the same reason uh, that the, the powers that be um, – uh, depressed the story of their life. I mean, if you ask the average person even involved in magic, uh, what about Trithemius? Quite a lot of people won't know. And if you'd ask people about John Dee back in the 50s, uh, they wouldn't have had any idea either. So um, in restoring uh, his work, uh, that has been fun. Um, and uh, well, yeah, and uh, it's got to be into English. It can't be back into Latin because there are, there are very few people now that read the classical languages. Um, my degree was in classics, so I, I uh, focused on Latin and uh, Greek. And then I did uh, 
formal courses in Hebrew as well, because I realized that that was necessary for magic. Um, but uh, none of those are very good in, uh, in uh, traveling around. Uh, certainly classical Greek doesn't work in Greece, and um, my Hebrew pronunciation is probably a bit crap and probably doesn't work in, in, uh, in Israel, although there are other problems happening there at the moment. I know Dr. Skinner, myself, and the listeners truly appreciate your time. International author, scholar, he's collaborating again with Daniel Clark in this upcoming tome, all four books of Tritemius's Steganographia for the first time presented and translated in English together. Dr. Stephen Skinner, thank you so, so much, as always, for just taking the time and, and sharing your wisdom on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Uh, well, I do as well, because uh, you do ask the most interesting questions. And, and you understand the subject, which is more than you can say for some of the, the podcasts. Uh, but anyway, well, so yeah, thanks, Alex. Thanks.